Okay, so it's Tuesday, September 18, 2018. Mm -hmm. This is Layla Burrell interviewing Tanya Walker in her apartment in Harlem for the Stonewall Oral History Project. Thank you, Tanya. You're welcome. So could you um, tell me where and when you were born and a little bit about how you grew up? I was born in Staten Island, New York. Um, you want to date? If you, if you want to say. I was born in Staten Island, New York, 1963, uh, May 5th. Can you tell me something about what life was like when you were a kid? What life was like when I was a kid? Um, well, I used to see the Vietnam War on TV. My mother would watch TV. Um, I remember seeing numbers on the TV and my mother crying. And uh, it was uh, South Plainfield, New Jersey. You know, it's a predominantly white town. It was, um, but they had really good schools. It was really a nice neighborhood, nice area. So you grew up mostly in South Plainfield? Yeah. But, well, no, because we moved to Charlotte when I was, Charlotte, North Carolina, when I was uh, 12 years old. So I went to seventh grade, part of seventh grade in North Carolina. And, and I graduated high school there in 19, uh-huh, go ahead. Sorry. Can you tell me a little about your family? Who, who were you growing up with? A mother, father, and uh, five other siblings. Where do you fit in, in the line? I'm the fourth oldest. And can you tell me what you were like as a kid? How do you remember yourself? I don't remember myself. I remember myself as being very feminine uh, effeminate, you know, kid. Um, I wanted to know everything, you know. I wanted to know why, 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 you know. And uh, that's basically the way I was. You know, I wanted to know everything. And were you sure of yourself? Was I sure of myself? Hmm. I felt like, you know, when I was a little kid that I was gonna grow up to be a girl like my sisters, you know? I felt like I was gonna be a girl, I was gonna grow up to be a girl. I didn't know, you know, until my mother said, you know, boys don't play with dolls and all that other stuff. But uh, I, didn't see my, I didn't see myself as a boy, but everybody else did. So I basically pretended to be what they wanted me to be. My dad wanted me to be a preacher, you know? And uh, I guess that's what Fathers, you know, who came from the South, the uh, Jim Crow South, wanted for their kids or whatever, but that's not what I wanted for myself. You know, I wanted more. I wanted to be a ballerina. I wanted to be a dancer. And uh, my mother told me that only queers and, you know, fags dance, you know, and uh, that's really what I wanted to be a dancer. <laughs> that's why. What, what I really. What was it like when your mother said that to you? What was it like? It was like somebody dropped a house on me. I felt like somebody dropped a house on me. I felt terrible, horrible, because I didn't understand anything. You know, why, you know, why is she saying this? I didn't understand. And then did you feel like you had to work hard to pretend you were somebody you knew you weren't? Yes, I had to work hard to pretend. I had to really pretend. I had to play with Barbie in the closet with, uh, my father bought me these little Hess trucks, tractor trailers, because my father was a truck driver, you know, when he worked. And uh, I would just use the uh, Hess truck lights for the Barbie, and I used to do shows in the closet with the Barbie dolls. So, you know, I had to hide, because I could be attacked, you know, beaten or whatever for playing with dolls, you know. And did that happen? Did you get beaten? Of course. My mother was, she was raised Christian. You know, her father was a minister, you know, bishop, you know. And uh, she believed that uh, the homosexuality was wrong and uh, that you would go to hell. You know, those were her beliefs, you know. That's how she was raised. And so did you openly struggle with her? Did I openly struggle with her? Yes, I did. But, you know, yeah, I struggled with that. But, you know, I had other sisters and brothers, you know, so, you know. And did you have any allies in the family? 
Mm. No, not really. No. My father was okay. You know, he was like, uh, you know, that he told me that if I was going to grow up to be gay, to be the best person that I could be, you know, because my father had gay friends and stuff, you know. He practically raised himself. So, you know, my mother grew up, you know, with a sheltered life. What was your dad's story that made him a little more open? Well, he left home when he was 12, so he grew up on the streets, so he had all kinds of friends, you know, LGBT, you know, straight, whatever. He had all kinds of friends, so he understood more. And he understood stood me more being trans after he saw uh, Caitlyn Jenner come out on TV. But, but that was only very recently. That was recently that he understood me more when he saw Caitlyn Jenner come out. And what was that like for you? It was great. It was great. You know, but we always talked, and we always, my father and I, we always talk, and, you know... I mean, he misgenders me sometimes, but, you know, he's my dad, you know. He tries to get it right, but at least he's trying. So tell me, what was high school like? Hmm. Horrible. High school was awful. I couldn't wait to get out of school. I didn't feel like I was being educated. I felt like I was just being dumbed down more. I really didn't like it. I was basically alone. I worked two jobs, and I went to high school because my father had like a janitorial service. And, uh, you know, so I worked all the time, we worked. You know, after I got off my regular job at like, I don't think the place closed at 10 o'clock or whatever, I have to stay till 12 o'clock my, till my family got there to clean up the restaurant. And, uh, you know, I had to scrub floors, clean grills and stuff like that until like, four or five o'clock in the morning before school. And were you working to help support your family or were you planning your exit? What were you, what were you doing with the money you were making? I wasn't making all that money. I mean, my parents were making it. I wasn't making it, so yeah, they were making it, but I wasn't making it. You know, um, I just worked my regular job and, you know, we had to pay at home. And, you know, my father wanted to teach us responsibility that you cannot live with all, with all your money. You're going to have to pay bills. So, you know, and it worked out well because no one in my family is homeless or unemployed. And, and what were you like in high school? Like, what was, what was happening in, at school? Were you... I was, oh, they used to call me names all the time, you know, every gay epithet in the world. And then one day, they wanted someone to, uh, to be uh, on the student council. And uh, everybody just started voting for me. I didn't even know the people in the class, but they started voting for me. So I was the lead in the class for the student council. And how did you explain that to yourself? What happened there? I don't know. I, I don't know if they did it just to make fun out of me or, or just to laugh at me when I got in front of the class, but they chose me, you know? And how did you identify yourself, maybe not to the world, but to yourself at that point? Did you, did you think, did you, at that point, did you think I'm going to be a girl one day? Or did it was you... always in my subconscious. Always in my subconscious. And did it mean something to you when people called you gay? Did you think, no, you're wrong, that's not what I am? Or what did you think when they were, besides being hurt, what, what did you think of how people saw you versus how you saw yourself? Uh, I, I really hated it. You know, uh, back, in, back then in the 70s, you know, the late 70s, the girls were wearing... Um, dance skins with the crisscross back straps, you know, strings across the back, and they were wearing candies. And I wanted to wear candies. I wanted to wear my dance skin. I wanted to wear a wrap skirt. I wanted to dress like that. I always wanted to dress like that. I hated pretending to be somebody I really wasn't. You know, I just hated pretending. Did you know anybody who who you thought understood you and shared your feelings about themselves? I met one, no. I saw other trans people and drag queens 
at straight clubs when, you know, after I got older. I saw transsexuals and stuff after I got older, but I really, you know, I didn't really talk to them or anything. I, I avoided them, kind of like an internalized transphobia, mm -hmm. you know, you, you kind of have when you, when, you know, when, I, when you first uh, are beginning to realize who you are. Because you don't know if you're safe or not, right? Yeah, it's not a safe world. I mean, it's just not. People are very unaccepting. And it's, you know, when you identify, when you were assigned male at birth and you identify as a woman or female, that's a step down in society. Guys are like, what the F? You, what do you mean? You want to be a girl. You know, they want you to be um, a thug or a you know, tough guy or whatever. They want you to be like them. You know, friends with them, they want you to be a womanizer. They want you to be, you know, sexist and all those things that are several men, you know, many men are. And, um, you know, because I've seen a lot of things, you know. I've seen how they are. I've heard the things they've said about women and things like that, and I disagreed, but, you know. So what happened after high school? What did you do when you graduated? I was, before I graduated high school, I was sworn in the military. I put my hand up in front of a photo of Ronald Reagan. Uh, he was president at the time, in 1980, and I was sworn into the military. And how did that happen? Did, did that feel like a choice you were making or something you were told to do? Or? Well, my dad said that I would change. He said, oh, you'll change. Uh, so I said, oh, maybe I will change. So I thought that I wanted, when I went into the military that I was to come out heterosexual, married with children, and all that. I thought I was going to change. I thought I was going to, you know, come out different, you know. It didn't happen. How long were you in the military? <laughs> For like four years. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about that time? About the military? Yeah. Mm, it's a... A lot of people in the closet, a lot of gay men and women, lesbians in the closet. A lot of them were in the closet. They were living in, uh, they had marriages of convenience, living off base, uh, in separate rooms. And they met their lovers and stuff in the separate rooms. And they were very, there was a lot of internalized homophobia in the military. And um, if you were effeminate or somebody knew that maybe thought you were gay or whatever, they would avoid you like the plague because they didn't want to be outed. You know, because there was no don't ask, don't tell. There was, if they found out you were gay and they caught you, you were getting out. You were getting a dishonorable discharge and you were going to get stripped of your rank. So there was, there was no playing around when I was in. And so how did you manage that time? How did I manage it? Yeah. Uh, I just couldn't wait to get out, you know. I couldn't wait to get out. I went to gay clubs and stuff while I was in. So was there a point when you realized that your dad was wrong and you weren't going to change? Yes. Yes it, yes, it was. When I got into the military and I was living in the barracks in Wildflick in Germany, and um, a lot of things happened. You want to tell me a little about that or no? A lot of things happened in the uh, military. That, you know, a lot of sexual violence mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, trauma and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then what happened when you left the military? I want to tell you a little bit more oh, please. about the military. Please. When I first got to... I, I, you know, I went to the, uh, when I was in the military, I got to the um, processing center. We were there for like a week. And, you know, they give you uniforms. They, uh, you get to know everybody. You learn how to march. You learn how to salute. You learn a little bit about how you're supposed to, pre you know, pretend when you get to basic training or whatever, or act. And so um, I, they put us on cattle trailers. Not the buses you see on the video with the Marines. They put us on cattle trailers. And um, the, uh, so we were pulling up in the cattle trailers. And uh, the drill sergeant jumped on the bus. And he said, the last one's ass off is mine. And it wasn't like two uh, exits you could get through. It was like just one little door. And so we were falling all over each other, 
plot, trying to get out of this cattle trailer, you know, and uh, I mean, it was really hard, but we had our, we had these duffel bags and it was really, uh, really rough, you know, and, uh, you know, so we got into formation, you know, after we got off, after everybody made it off the bus, there's about 300 of us in formation. And so the drill sergeant jumped up on the podium and says, uh, let's welcome the first girl in the army, Private Walker. And everybody started laughing and clapping and cheering and because they knew from the processing center that I might be gay or I might be something or whatever. So the drill sergeant, he got on the podium and he said that. And that set me up for a lot of, a lot of attacks and violence and verbal assaults and all kinds of stuff. I didn't know he was going to do that. I didn't know, I didn't know anything. I, I was called, you know, a few names, you know, and harassed as a faggot and all that, you know, and that's the word they used. And I, um, you know, I dealt with it. I handled myself. You know, I had to fight sometimes, you know. I had to really pretend and rough a couple of guys up and stuff like that, you know, jack them up. You know, and show them I meant business. You know, they force me to be more masculine in the military. You know, they force you, like. Because you're trying to save yourself. Yeah. They force you, like, you know, you're not gonna, I'm not going to be a pushover, you know. No. You know, so I had to handle myself, and I handled them. But I never got in trouble for fighting. And sometimes I had to fight. I had to defend myself. It was fight or or get beaten. You know. You know, there's the flight flight or flee response. I fight. I stood there and fought. And when did you realize that that no matter how hard it was, you were you were yourself and you had to find a way to to be yourself. Just going to the gay, I would go to the gay clubs, you know, just, you know, in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, when I was stationed in Felt Belleville, Virginia, I would go to the, uh, to the clubs in Washington, uh, 19th and M. They had uh, a lot of gay college kids uh, from Georgetown and all those schools, gay kids was in those clubs. And I loved the music and I loved dancing and I just loved it. And the do atmosphere. You, do you remember if, like where you first felt safe? Like was that a safe space? It was pretty safe, in the clubs. You know, people were you know very acting very butch and macho and masculine before they got there. You wouldn't even know who was gay before you got there. And then when you get in the club, they're like, "Oh, Mary, oh, girl," you know, and they start you know, carrying on like that. You know, but it was a lot of, um, you know, it was a lot of secrets and a lot of hiding and a lot of stuff people did. You know. In the military, it was very, you know, people didn't want to be a failure. They wanted to stay in the military. They didn't want to get kicked out, dishonorable discharge, and nobody wanted that for themselves, except for the people who didn't want to do the running and exercises and shoot and all that stuff. What kind of work did you do in the military? Uh, they gave me some job, like a 62J10. It was a general construction equipment operator, but I had to operate bulldozers, backhoes, tractor trailers and dump trucks, five ton dump trucks and stuff like that. You know, they gave me something really masculine, an air compressor, you know, transferable skills that I never did out here. Nobody ever knew that. I could be making big money. If you worked construction. Yeah, transferable skills. Only if I could wear a dress would I have done construction work but they weren't going to accept me, you know. Yeah, it's not a welcoming environment. No, it's not. They're very macho, very, you know, very macho. So I didn't do that when I got out. So did you get out by choice? Mostly, mostly I was ready to get out. I was ready to get out of there. I was ready to get out the military. I was ready. Can you tell me about that? It was... You know, it was, um, 
we didn't go to combat. We were preparing for combat. We never got there. You know, all the time we're going in the field, preparing for combat, pre preparing, you know, uh, going to the motor pool, getting the vehicles ready, going to the arms room, getting our weapons, you know, getting our gas masks, getting all of our equipment together, going to the field constantly in the dead of winter. When it's below zero, we'd go to the field. So, uh, you know, we never went. So I was like, you know, since it's never going to happen, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go live my life, you know getting older now. So what did you do when you left the military? What did I do when I left the military? I worked at Winn-Dixie in Charlotte, North Carolina for a little while. My father wanted me to be a truck driver. And so, you know, I drove tractor and trailers around the yard and backed them up to the door to unload them and stuff like that. And uh, lifted uh, crates, stacked crates and unloaded trailers and, you know, masculine again and so i just saw myself as a tomboy that i can do what the boys do that's how i got through it oh, i'm a tomboy i'll do what they do you know and were you in the outside world still pretending trying to sort of pass as a boy and man at that point no not really no i didn't i transitioned after a car accident a bad car accident i was on my lunch break i was working for saint vincent's hospital in Staten Island before they closed. Um, what, was, is this many years later? When was that? This was in 19, this was in 1987. I started working at St. Vincent's. I worked as a porter in a hospital. And then the, after the car accident, which cracked my skull and everything, I decided to uh, a transition. I said, I'm going to do it. So I started hanging out with homeless, queer people at the ferry terminal. I was living with my aunt at the time in Toad Hill over there in Staten Island and Lord Livingston Avenue over there near Toad Hill, where my mother grew up. Um, and uh, I started hanging out with queer people, homeless people at the ferry terminal in Staten Island. And uh, they said, you look like your name should be Tanya. <laughs> you know, because I was already wearing the hairstyles and stuff. And I said, yeah, maybe you're right. You know, maybe you're right. My friend Tunisia and Melanie, they said, she said, yeah, right. I think you should uh, be Tanya. And then let's go get some clothes. And we started going to get clothes and dress and stuff. And then they took me to 14th Street um, in the meat packing district. Um, and I didn't know what we were doing there. And they said, oh, Tanya, they're looking at you. Go over to the car window, say hi. So I went over to the car window to say hi to the guy. And he was asking me how much, you know, get in, whatever. And I started doing sex work. And how did that feel? It didn't feel good. I don't like, I didn't really like doing sex work. I don't have anything against sex work, but I really didn't like sex work. It wasn't me because I had worked jobs all my life and worked all my life, you know. And I was beginning my transition, and uh, they weren't hiring uh, trans people that weren't stealth at that time. You know, they weren't hiring you. Couldn't find a job. They would call me it thing, get the F out of here, blah, 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 blah. You know. And sex work was the work you could get? Sex work was the work I could get. I got in cars with a lot of married men with the baby seat right in the back of the car. Their wives didn't know. And um, a lot of men that you would never suspect, you know, messed around. And they were really, you know, they were some of them, you know, some of them you just talked to, some of them, but most of them, a lot of them were for sex. They wanted sex. They wanted to get their stuff off. Some of them were on drugs. You know, they wanted to get their stuff off and, you know, they really, they, they liked us. They really, some of them really liked us, but they, they weren't going to give up their marriage or whatever for us, but not that much, but they liked us. And you had a group of girlfriends to hang out with? I had a few, yeah. A group of girlfriends, yeah. And where did you live at that point? Where did I live? In an abandoned building near the ferry terminal. In an abandoned building with no windows in the winter.
<laughs> in the cold. Yeah, sleeping under wool blankets. And did your family know where you were, or what did they think you were? I don't know if they knew. I think I told them I was homeless. I don't know if I told them, but I was homeless. I was living, yes, in an abandoned building. And did they know that you had transitioned, or that you were transitioning? No, I don't think so. It's that one day they showed up to my apartment in Staten Island, and uh, I said, hi, how you doing? And um, I had on shorts. They said, oh, you have pretty legs. And they were kind of in shock. And who was it who came to the door? When I... Uh, who, who was it who came to visit that you weren't... My mother and father came up to visit. This is after I had gotten an apartment and everything. Were they coming to check on you, or what, are you, what was happening? They were visiting the city. You know, I, at that time, I think my grandmother was still alive and uh, my, they still owned property on Livingston Avenue in Staten Island at the time. And what, how did that go when they realized that you were Tanya now? They were a little shocked and, you know, they were a little, you know, probably not impressed, but I didn't care. You know, I was going to be me and that's going to, that's it. This is me. I'm grown. I'm in my own apartment, you know, at this time. And I said, I'm going to be me. That's it. No hiding anymore. Closet doors have blown off. Hit with a hand grenade. They're gone. You know. How'd that feel? It felt, it felt, um, it felt, um, what's that word I'm looking for? It's a word that just was in my mind that just went, broop out the way. Um, um, revolutionary. It was a rev revolutionary act for me to be me and come out to be me. It's a revolutionary act right now for me to walk out the door or to talk to you. It's a revolutionary act to me to be able to be me wherever and not care. You know, it took a lot of long time to accept myself. You know, a lot of self-acceptance, a lot of you know, internal things that I had to, that I had to do to, to be me. And do you still have to work sometimes to be like, hey, I'm fine? No, no. I don't really have to do that. No, because I, I facilitate a group at Sage, a support group. And uh, about three times uh, a month. And, um, you know, I get a lot of support there as well. And I help support them as well. I knew that about you. I wanted to ask about Sage. How did you um, come to facilitate the group? Pony Knowles called me up, who works at Sage, and said, hey, Tanya, I don't know where he, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if somebody gave him my name or, or what happened, um, but he, uh, he called me up and asked me, did I want to facilitate a group there? Uh, the, uh, Prior facilitator had died, and they needed a facilitator, so I decided to do it. And what is it like for you? Like, how, how does it feel to be sitting in a group and, and helping other people? It's empowering. It's empowering. Because I used to be a case manager at Housing Works for seven years, and a transgender transitional housing program. So I had lo a lot of experience with trans and gender nonconforming people and queer people in New York, so. I mean, we, it was a housing program, you know, and I saw a lot of trans people in crisis. I, I, I had crisis myself, but I dealt with a lot of people in crisis, so. How did you come to work at Housing Works? I was in the job. I, uh, Sheila Spivey, who's deceased now, passed away, uh, asked me to come over there and uh, go into the uh, job training program and uh, I wanted to be a um, residential aide uh, while I was going through the job training program. I was in it for a year and uh, they said no, we want you to be a case manager because of my, I guess my uh, grades or whatever. And They wanted me to be a case manager and uh, I did it for 
Wow. So I think you're also on the board of the Audre Lorde Project. Yes. Is that correct? Can you tell me about that? Yeah, I got, yeah, I've been on the board of the Audre Lorde Project for a while. Um, I'm the only trans person, so, you know. Tell me about that. What's that like? You need, you know, you need more trans people on a, on anything, you know, with similar view, views or opposing views, you know, and uh, you just need more. Is that something you're advocating for? Right now? Mm -hmm. No. No. Do you like being on the board? What, what about that project is interesting to you? About Audre Lord? Yeah. Um, you know, I like Audre Lord. You know, Audre Lord. You know, she passed away from cancer, and um, I've been in trans justice there, and uh, uh, I went to trans justice school, I should say, there, and um, I like being around queer people, LGBT queer people. You know, I like it, all different kinds. I like all different kinds. You know, of queer people. I, you know, I, when I came out, you know, I lived my life around all kinds of people, queer people and, you know, cis, trans, gender non-conforming, non-binary people, queer people of all colors, <laughs> or, you know, all cultures, and socioeconomic groups. So I wanted to ask you, um, Robert mentioned that he met you at a meeting where he was talking about the Stonewall Oral History Project. Yes. And that um, you were concerned that trans voices be included? Yes. So can you tell me what, what I wasn't at that meeting, so what was happening and, and what was your concern and what's a way to help address that? Well, they weren't really, they weren't really uh, talking about trans people because, you know, we weren't called trans when I came out. We were drag queens. We were... Um, us transsexuals or drag queens, but most of the gay community called us drag queens, you know, when I came out. So, or, you know, and so, uh, you know, as soon as we became uh, transgender, um, I think that uh, they didn't put Marsha P. Johnson and um, Silver Rivera into Stonewall. But mainly, I know Marsha was instrumental in Stonewall because, um, she told me she started fighting right in the front. She threw a rock into the stone wall, you know, because they were, you know, the police were harassing the drag queens. They could, you could, you stood out. You know, most of the guys that went into stone wall were educated cis white males that were in stone wall. And uh, there was a lot of homeless children who hung out in the front and sex workers, and children that hung out in the front, you know, and uh, Marsha P. Johnson was in the first group of drag queens that could get into the stone wall. So, you know, so she was really, she was there that night, she was instrumental. It started because of her. They were messing with the drag queens. You know, the gay men didn't, in the bar, they didn't want their name, she said, in the paper. You know, they didn't want their name in the paper. They had jobs, they had inheritances. Marsha didn't have any of that. Marsha was kicked out a long time ago, you know, so she was one of the street homeless people that was out there, you know, and, you know, she just became a, you know, a revolutionary by accident. And you knew her, it sounds like. Well, I spoke with her quite a few times in the 80s. Where did you meet her? But I didn't transition then. You know, when I had met her, I didn't, I hadn't transitioned. Christopher Street. She stood on the corner. Sometimes she was a little bit out of it. But other times she was she was with it, and she didn't always she you know she, she didn't always not pay it no mind. She would defend herself. So, and do you remember what it meant to you to talk to her? Well, she said, well, when I came to the village, a gay white man came up to me. You know, we were coming down, you know, walking down Christopher Street. You know, la la guy, you know, la 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 la. You know, because I had just gotten out the military in 84, so I was here in 86, so this is in 1986. Coming down Christopher Street, there was boys, guys on both sides of the street, hustlers, 
uh, drug dealers, uh, homeless kids, homeless youth, everything was out there. And, uh, you know, all the bars were open and uh, it was really alive. There was no cell phones, none of this technology, um, you know, and uh, it was really sad. But, you know, it was it was nice. It was lively. It was really nice. You know, it was all different kinds of people out there, you know, blacks, Hispanics, whites, everybody was out there just enjoying themselves, you know, enjoying being gay, trans, you know, whatever, gender nonconforming, whatever. And in that mix, you met her? In the mix, yeah. She'd be standing right on the corner when you come down Christopher Street by Charles Street. She'd be standing there on the corner. With, uh, she had on flowers and a skirt. She had a dress, or, or looked like a dress or a skirt, and it had flowers around it and flowers in her hat, and uh, she was standing on the corner. And she was like, sometimes she'd be like talking to herself a little, and I'd be like, dog, why are you doing that? So, you know, the gay white man said, do you see her? When we came down to Christian Street the first time in 86, and I was like, yeah, I see her, yeah, whatever, you know. And he said, um, She's the reason why we're down here. That don't mess with her. She is the reason why we are down here and, you know, living our gay lives right now. Don't mess with her. And uh, I said, wow, that's interesting, you know. So I didn't really talk to her about all that. You know, I wasn't interested in activism and all that at that time, you know. But um, I said, wow, you know. But I really didn't understand why, you know, you know, why he said that. So how did you find out? How did you come to Later, that? later, later about Stonewall and everything. Because nobody was really talking about it. I mean, you know, there was hustlers down there. There was, you know, people were on drugs. People were high, you know, you know, trying to deal with their problems. You know, a lot of people left broken homes or were kicked out as children. There was a lot of child prostitutes, pr prostitution going on and all kinds of stuff down there. It was really horrible. It was really, you know, I hadn't transitioned, you know, at that time, but it was really horrible in the village. You know, it was, but we were free. And it was the only place that LGBT youth and, you know, gay people had to go was the village. The only place that I knew to hang out, you know. It wasn't safe in the neighborhoods because you could be attacked. But in the village, everybody felt, they felt, um, they felt at home. And do you remember if you thought that Marsha was kind of, despite her troubles, kind of a model? Like, oh, look at her and... Yeah, she, would, she was right there. She would, she would panhandle and give her money to, you know, give it to us. She'd give her money to us, all of it, you know, so. And she told us how to be safe and everything. And do you remember how you learned about Stonewall? How I learned about Stonewall? Well, I saw, when I was a little kid, I saw something on TV, on the news. But, um, you know, I heard something about those gays are doing something up there again, or doing something, you know, that's about it. And my uncle was a police officer in the village in those days, uh, NYPD. And so did but he didn't really say anything to me about it. But he worked in the village, and he said it was the best, best job he ever had. And he worked in the village for like 20 years, for a long time, like 20 years maybe. Did you ever ask him about it later when you knew what had happened? No, I didn't talk to him about it. I, I didn't really ask him about what he did in the village. But he was very accepting of me. My uncle was very accepting of me. He accepted me right away. So what do you want to be called now? You know, he was very accepting. That must have felt good. Yeah, it was liberating to be able to, you know, be able to have a relative that was accepting. So, so you were saying that at first you had no interest in activism and you had some vague idea that something had happened. How did, how did that change happen for you? Because now you're an activist and a spokesperson. Yeah. And how did you go from kind of vaguely knowing something to being not just informed, but really pushing for justice? I was going to Staten Island College, and I was head of the uh, uh, lesbian gay organization they had out there in the 90s. 
And, um, you know, I had got, I was tired of sex work. I wanted to go to school, get an education, get a decent job, you know, every, the dreams that everyone else has, you know, because I really didn't, you know, I really didn't enjoy sex work. So I decided to go to college, um, signed up, I took the test, got in, and I was going to school to be a social worker because I saw a lot of social problems here in New York City, a lot of homelessness in the 80s, a lot of poverty, a lot of, uh, you know, illiteracy and different things. So, you know, so I decided I wanted to become a, a social worker and help people. And so um, I uh, was at the college one day and um, they, uh, I heard about, you know, I read about in the paper that uh, Guy V. Molinari, the borough president at that time, said, uh, this, I think it was in 94, said that um, Judge Karen Burstein didn't, he didn't think she should be um, attorney general. He didn't think she was fit to be attorney general. And, uh, uh, you know, I begged to differ. And I said, um, so I was told that somebody from his staff was coming to the college. So uh, I said, really? And they said, yeah. And I, they said, there's gonna be some cameras and stuff. and. Uh, you know, so get ready, make a sign, and um, just uh, stand there and uh, hold up the sign, you and these other people. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, I don't want to do that. And they said, uh, you know, I said, can't we do this a better way? And they said, uh, no. Make your sign, get out there, and hold it up. You know, st you know stand up for Karen Burstein. And I said, okay. I said, uh, she didn't have, she shouldn't be attorney general when she was qualified, you know. And, uh, you know, I became a feminist at that point. And was that the author? And an activist. Okay. Yeah. And I made the, oh. Can you okay. I'm gonna stand up for you. Yeah, Karen Burstein, yeah. But it really, it drove me into activism, you know, and they made me the head of the, the LGBT, um, it was, what do you call it? It's a group at the college. I had to print flyers. I, they gave me money to purchase food. I purchased pizza for everyone in the class. I mean, you know, for, you know, that came to the class and, uh, not many people came. One or two people showed up. People used to, I used to watch the door, you know, while I was talking, and I would see people peek into the class and zip by the door before I could see their face. They would, I would just see eyes and heads peeking, you know, uh, because um, they didn't want to be outed as being uh, gay or lesbian. But they wanted to come inside, but they just couldn't. So, and do you remember, so Karen Burstyn was qualified and a lesbian and that out lesbian an outlet so that made her disqualified in Molinari's eyes yes right? he didn't he said she was uh unfit to serve as attorney general of New York state and do you remember what it was that at, at that moment that kind of flipped the switch for you to say no I'm actually going to take a stand and I'm, yeah we're going to take a stand I'm you know I'm here that I'm the head of this uh LGBT group here at the college and you know I feel like I should do this I should do this for her, you know, and she's a woman, you know, he, you know, what does he know, you know, about uh, an out lesbian woman? What does he know? He's, you know, he, uh, you know, after dealing with a lot of, you know, biases and prejudices and, you know, anti LGBT stuff in my life, um, you know, I felt emboldened and empowered by doing that, by holding up that sign. And, you know, that said gays and lesbians live in your barrel, too. Shame on you. You know, I felt empowered. And it made the front page of the Staten Island Advance. And um, after that, I got ran off the campus by carloads of students. What happened? I, um, what happened? I, uh. After I did that, I don't know. Um, they started calling me all kinds of names. Faggots, queers, get the fuck out of here. What the fuck are you? Get out of here. Uh, we'll kill you. They threatened my life. Um, don't ever come back here again. 
You know, so I was afraid. And did you leave school? Yes, I left school. Yes, I did. They're purposely doing that. It's deliberate. It's deliberate. I would really like to call the landlord's office and tell them to uh, I get it all the time. Just pure nasty. Just pure nasty. Yeah, because they know that, that, that something's going on down here, so they're trying to disrupt it. It's a gay guy. It's a black gay guy upstairs who's doing it. Where is he? Yeah, he's on drugs. Mm -hmm. Crystal meth user. Let's see if he stops. Yeah. So you want me to go on? Yeah. So so what happened when you left uh, the college? What happened when I left the college? Hmm. When I left the college, I was really, you know, horrified. So I called the college and uh, uh, snuck back on campus, and I went to the administration and uh, tried to get back in, and they told me they couldn't help me. I talked to the, um, one of the girls laughed at me uh, that I was talking to. And uh, when I returned to the college of Staten Island and, um, and you know, the police wouldn't help, nobody would help. And uh, the girl that was laughing at me as I was getting ready to leave, you know, cause there was a bunch of people looking at me you know, administration when I was talking to them about what had happened and that my life was threatened and all that stuff. So uh, one of the girls, she was just laughing as I was talking, just sniggling, laughing, like rubbing it in. So, you know, I still tried to get in. You know, I still, you know, begged to get back in. And um, as I was leaving and I was finished and I was down the hallway, she runs up to me in tears. And I said, you were the main one laughing. You were the main one laughing. What do you want to talk to me about? She told me she was a lesbian and she couldn't come out. She couldn't come out the closet. And um, she said, I know I was laughing, I'm sorry. She apologized. She was a white girl, real pretty. I mean, really pretty. And she said, I can't come out the closet and um, you know, that's why I was laughing. I was really crying inside, and she just broke out crying. She was crying, horrified, having to out herself to me. Did you graduate from the no, no, I didn't. I was too terrified, too traumatized to go back. But did you leave um, an activist? Were you... Did, were you was that kind of activist bug something you took with you? Yes, I did. I took it with me. Yes, I did. I took it with me. But then I had to go back to doing sex work again. You know, I had to go back to doing sex work again because, you know, it wasn't like, I didn't feel like I gave up. I was running for my life. I was afraid. You know, we had no rights. We had no protections. We had no programs to run to. We had no uh, GMHC. We had no... Uh, NITAG or, you know, New York Transgender Advocacy Group or anywhere to run to. We didn't have uh, Audre Lorde or any of these other organizations that we currently have and take for granted, many of us, uh, in those days. So I was on my own. Where do you, where, where did you finally find support? You know, and my friends, and a few, I had a few friends, yeah. I found support in some of my friends. My girlfriend, Melanie, on Staten Island. Oh, you know, Alexis, you know, different friends. I had some gay friends, Phil. You know, he was a gay guy, black gay guy. I had some white gay friends. I had all kinds of friends. And when did you find an organization or organizations that where you felt what people were dealing with was relevant for you. Like to, now, today, there's Sage and Audre Lorde, but in the sort of 
What was some of the early groups that or were there any? There were some around, but I didn't go to any of those groups. I didn't go to any groups back then. There were some groups that were happening, but I think um, Project, I think there was a, there was a group, uh, PJ, I think it was called, what was it called, PJP, Project Health Project, what, that was around. They had some groups going on in there, but other than that, I, you know, I found out about that years later. So the first place that I went to was uh, Housing Works, where I went, did more activism. And I loved it because we did more activism fighting AIDS, fighting uh, you know, AIDS oppression and fighting for different things with AIDS with Charles King and uh, Keith Kyler. Uh, and I enjoyed that. A lot of activism, you know, speaking truth to power. Uh, you know, you, you know, let you know, visiting the legislator, legislatures, and um, the elected officials, and you know, lobbying, you know, for uh, you know, for people to be able to get a SRO for Hasa from Hasa, you know, because um, at one point they were sending people to uh, empty warehouses in Queens. You know, people would need housing at HRA, and they would just send them anywhere. They wouldn't even they wouldn't send them to a to a hotel or SRO. They would send them to you know. So I fought against that, you know, along with Housing Works, and I you know, and I fought for uh, you know Stand Up Harlem, which is a part of Housing Works here in uh, Harlem. You know, we went to one of those not in my backyard meetings in Albany to fight for, our, you know, to get stand up Harlem. And, you know, we were really fighting for something. And uh, that's when my activism went into high gear at Housing Works. And then we started working on, uh, with Housing Works, we started working on, um, and uh, what was it called? Um, we were working on Sonda. I don't know what that is. Sonda, I don't know, I forgot the acronym, but it was, uh, it was for, you know, gay marriage and gay rights and trans rights and stuff like that. Sonda. In New York State. Right? In New York State. And they took us off of Sonda and passed gay marriage. We were just pushed under the bus. I've talked to people about that. That was, that was both outrageous and really painful. It was. It was horrible. It was, uh, it was terrible. Because uh, Senator Tom DeWayne... Uh, was fighting with us at that time, and he said that uh, he told them to add transgender protections to the bill, and uh, uh, they said no, that they didn't think that Sonda would pass with uh, trans people on the bill, and he said it will pass, and he begged them to put it on the, uh, to put us on, but they didn't, they left us out, so now uh, we're fighting for gender. And um, I'm the co-founder of uh, New York Transgender Advocacy Group, NITAG. I created the name. Created the name, yes. That's great. I co-founded the organization that Kiara is running and Amanda Babine are running. And I know gender stands for gender equality. Gender non -dis Well, gender, yeah. It's, the, you know, it's, it's a bill that will give, you know, full protections to trans people throughout the state of New York. Because currently, New York State, we're not fully protected. I mean, we have some, from the governor, we have some, uh, we have some uh, protections with under Governor Cuomo. But um, when he leaves office, you know, um, whoever gets in can overturn everything. So, a lot of things. Law, yeah. But in New York City, we have protections, you know, in New York City, but... We want protections for New York State, so I'm going to be working in the near future with NITAG to fight for our agenda. You know, we've been fighting for 13 years, so, you know, um, and still, you know, the Assembly always passes it, but the Senate, it, you know, it never gets to the floor for a vote in the Senate, so 
Um, we're going to continue the fight. And, uh, you know, for gender in New York State, because, um, you know, some trans people are veterans. Some trans people have families with children, small children, young children, you know. You know, we're born this way. And that's not something that we just, uh, you know, dream of, just want to be, you know. You know, this is, we're born this way. You know, I was born this way. And I accept myself, you know, for being born this way, you know. It took a long time for self-acceptance for self because, you know, we live in a society, you know, that uh, tells you you're wrong or, you know, you should die or whatever. And I just don't believe that. You know, I have just as much right to be as anyone else, I feel. You know, we came, I came from my mother the same way you came from your mother. How are you better than me? That's how I feel. Absolutely. Let me ask you about Stonewall. Um, yeah. Was it meaningful to you when the Stonewall was made a national monument in 2015? Yes. 2016? Yeah. yeah. Can you tell me why? I thought that it was great that, um, that finally they recognized uh, Stonewall, you know, uh, the New York uh, parks uh, that recognize Stonewall because, um, and also because uh, trans people were instrumental in uh, getting gay rights for New York State and the world, you know, other parts of the world. And do you um, see Stonewall as a place that's important to go sort of as a gathering spot when, when major things happen? Like, I know there was a Hundreds of people went after gay marriage passed or after the Pulse massacre. Is that yeah. something that's meaningful to you? Yes. Yes, it is. It's meaningful to me. Because um, when uh, Trump uh, put in the transgender ban, I spoke in front of the, um, uh, I spoke in uh, Times Square. I spoke out in Times Square. And also I spoke in front of uh, Stonewall when he, um, he was attacking transgender children. So I spoke then, and we had a gathering there. I think Stonewall is the place. I mean, it's the, it's the uh, universe or center of the gay rights movement. It's why we had the gay rights movement, you know, in the world, you know, in, in the city and in the in the world, you know. Before that, you know, gay people were like uh, Marsha P said. Marsha said that she wanted to see, um, Marsha P Johnson said she wanted to see people. You know, gay people not have to hide in other people's parade. She wanted gay people to have their own parade. And that's why she fought that night in front of Stonewall. And plus, she got tired of getting beat up by the cops, you know, at that time. You know, she got tired of getting, you know, beat up. So when you went to Stone, in front of Stonewall to speak, how did that happen? How did that get organized? How did that get organized? Yeah. Well, I, I'm a known activist in New York City, you know, and I have a lot of connections, you know, because I've been, you know, doing a lot of activism and working on Genda and Sonda and, you know, all these different uh, issues. And, you know, um, I'm pretty well known to politicians and, you know, elected officials and different people in New York State, New York City. So did somebody call So I'm seen as a leader. You know, you know, I'm seen as a leader. Good. So would somebody have called and said, let's go tomorrow and have a rally and speak out? Or Well, now, yeah, somebody emailed me from City Hall. Uh, I was emailed from, got an email from City Hall. And um, they would say, uh, Tanya, uh, can you be down here at 1 o'clock? Can you, or, or 5 o'clock? To, for an interview with uh, uh, Channel 4 or Channel 1 or whatever. And I'd be in the middle of something. I'd be like, sure, instead of saying no. I'd say, sure, and I would do it. And then uh, we'd end up in front of the uh, stone wall, and uh, that's where we'd have our rally. And then I would start, you know, you know with, um, you know, doing the calls, you know, the... Uh, 
what do they call them? <laughs> like a call and response? Like a, like a, it's like uh, chanting. Yeah. I would do a chant. Yeah. Get everybody riled up, you know, you know, and uh, excited, you know, around the issue or whatever. Yeah. You think you're good at that partly because you're the, the grandchild of a preacher? You were saying your grandfather was a... He was also a college professor. Okay. So he was, uh, and a lot of other things, you know, so... He was, uh, but he was a civil rights leader in New York City. And, uh, you know, so um, I wasn't afraid, you know. He was very political. He was into politics, so, you know, you know. So what do you think when you think about the, your life path that, that you would be a civil rights leader in your own right today? How does that feel? It feels great. It feels great. It feels great. You know, I, you know, somebody has to do it. And I feel, um, I feel great about it. I feel um, that, it, that it must be done. You know, because I think that uh, trans rights are human rights and should be civil rights. Do you have concerns for the future about trans rights? Um, don't take them for granted. I, I would tell people, don't take them for granted. Um, what little we have, we can lose. Um, keep fighting, fight with us, and um, let's make our rights more permanent. Fight with us because, um, you know, um, and also strengthen, the, strengthen what we currently have. Strengthen the rights that we currently have. Because uh, if we don't, um, bad things can happen. You know, um, definitely. Um, you know, uh, in New York City, we live in the bubble. Like uh, my, the co-founder says, Kiara, and I, she always says, we live in a bubble. And, uh, you know, we have protections here. A lot of, you know, many trans women and trans people and gender non conforming are moving to New York City to find employment, to get their names changed, to, you know, to live their lives, you know. And uh, because in their hometowns, that's not possible. You know, many of them coming from red states, you know, to, you know, where they're, you know, discriminated against for going to use the, the restroom, you know. And uh, so they're running here. Do you ever meet trans kids at this point? I've met some trans children when I was at the White House. Yeah. As yeah. When, teenagers. Yeah. When I, I was invited to the White House, so I met them. No, they were little kids. They were, they were little kids. Little kids. Can you yeah. tell me when did, when did you go to the White, the White House? Can you tell me about that? Ooh, when did I go to the White House? Um, I think it was in. It was 2015 or 2016, could be 20, maybe 2016. We went to the White House. We were invited, yeah, to the White House, so. Can you tell me about it? What was the event? It was a transgender event, and they had uh, different speakers from different organizations uh, come and speak about what they were doing for towards transgender rights or what they were doing in their organizations and, uh, and uh, you know, from around the around the country and uh, they picked certain people to go and uh, it was really nice and there was uh, parents of transgender children there and there were transgender children who were there as well and they were you know talking about you know how they love their children and um, how they didn't want to lose their children to suicide and uh, you know, that they respect the gender identity of their children and that everyone else should as well. So knowing your own childhood experience, what's it like to hear parents talk like that? It was, it was very empowering, very empower, empowering for me and I believe for everyone there. It was very, it was very you know, um, it was great to see these parents stick up for these children, you know. And I, I thought the children were powerful as well because they, you know, they were allowed 
to come out as trans. If I would have said that when I was a kid, that, Mommy, I feel like a girl, oh, not such good things would have happened. There was no way I could say that to my mother. No way. And it shows you that things have changed and, uh, you know, that uh, the world has gotten a lot better, you know, as a result of these trans children coming out and their parents accepting them. I mean, it's not like they tolerate their children. They accept them, their children and they accept themselves for having trans children. And they didn't think that anything was wrong, that their child was born that way. And, you know, I thought that was great. That was fantastic. That was revolutionary. To, to you know, and, and accepting. I, it was, you know, just love, the love that they have for their children. And their children were dressed in their gender. And I thought that that was, I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. That these kids, they won't grow up depressed or unhappy. You know, you know they're, they're free. And, you know, I didn't have that freedom growing up, but I'm glad it's here now. I'm glad that freedom is here, you know, uh, for children. And I don't want to see it go away. So I'm going to continue to fight um, for, for more rights uh, for trans people. I mean, there's groups out there like TERF. It's a, a feminist group that uh, it's really a hate group um, and an anti-transgender group. Uh, they have lesbians in the group. And they also have cis hetero women in the group, and they're uh, they're very uh, very anti-trans. They say transgender women are not women, and they uh, they really uh, are really really mean towards trans women. You know, we have a lot of problems with suicide, homelessness, high unemployment, uh, mistreated in healthcare. Uh, you know, we're mistreated. You know, really bad, and you know, trans people are dying for their rights. They're dying for, you know, for, for uh, gender rights. Everywhere, you know, they're dying. I mean, there was a couple of transgender women who were undocumented, who were busted at the border, fleeing from their, uh, fleeing from their country in South America. I mean, bleeding and beaten and worn and torn you know, trying to get to America to be free and safe and uh, only to be rejected and locked up, you know, on the border they, you know, or sent back. You know, these people are, were fleeing horrific conditions. You know, they were fleeing murder, death, you know. And uh, as soon as they got to the border, they were rejected. And I think that's horrible. I think that... Um, I think that trans people, transgender people should be given uh, full protections and rights in this country. And uh, they should be given, what is that word I'm looking for? Uh, I can't, it came to my head and it just disappeared. Um, I think that they should be get granted, uh, what is that word? Not, it's not citizenship, but it's uh, asylum. They should be granted asylum in this country because um, they, they're really treated horrible in countries like Brazil, in Mexico, in, in uh, Venezuela, and other countries that, in South America. And uh, I, these girls uh, deserve to, uh, they deserve human and civil rights. They deserve to, be, to live, uh, you know, with dignity and respect in this world. And if they can't get it, in their own countries, then they, sh they should have the right to be here. And they should be fully protected under the Constitution of the United States, fully protected by all its laws, and uh, be able to uh, be self-actualized, as in Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, safety, housing, food, you know, health care. They deserve it, you know, because transgender people are very talented. And I think some of them are geniuses, and, you know, um, great things could happen in the world if they just uh, would uh, be more accepting of us in society. They have a lot to offer. They're artists, hairdressers, scientists, mathematicians, um, airplane pilots, airplane stewardess, you know, uh, generals, uh, lieutenants, everything. 
commanders of ships, you know, everything. Drill sergeants. But they happen to be, some of them happen to be trans women and trans men. I met one, I met a trans guy in Israel who was responsible for, uh, responsible for getting transgender people into the military, serving openly in the military in, um, in Israel. And uh, I forgot his name right now, but I shouldn't do that. But I just hate that I forgot his name. But yes, I met him in Israel and uh, uh, we need more people like him. You know, I disagree with, uh, with our president's view on uh, transgender people serving openly in the military. I mean, he's a five-time draft dodger. Uh, who is he to say who should serve this country and who shouldn't? You know, and uh, I think that transgender people should be able to serve openly in the military. We've been there all along. They just didn't know it. You know, we shot our guns. We, we killed for this country. We've bled and died and fought since, you know, since the beginning. Every, through every war, the Civil War, Revolutionary War, Civil War, all these wars, World War I, World War II, we've been here. And uh, they just didn't know it. And some of us were in high positions, you know, uh, and they didn't know we were there. And we're still here. You know, we deserve human and civil rights and respect and love just like anyone else. You know? Absolutely. And so do our families, our children, our families and our spouses and, you know. So before we say goodbye, is there anything <coughs> oh. you'd like to tell me about your life's path? your thoughts about trans rights and the, the struggle today or about how, how that maybe fits into Stonewall because as you were saying um, yesterday I interviewed a man who was the lawyer for the Gay Activists Alliance Yeah. and he was saying as is known that trans people were not particularly liked in the gay movement they weren't Nope. Although essential to its beginning and its and its its success, right. So, I wonder what you think about where what's happened in the last fifty years. Is there anything, either from your own life or from the larger movement, that you want to share? Like about like. Like what your thoughts are on where we are now and that ties to 50 years ago? Well, where we are now, we still have a lot of growing to do uh, in the LGBT community. Um, um, some, you know, there's some, you know, there's a little pushback against transgender people within the community. Uh, there's, a, there's a transphobia within the community in the LGBT community or LGB community T or T or whatever community. And, um, uh, there needs to be uh, more training of LGBT people about transgender people. Some of them, a lot of the older ones, don't get it. You know, as soon as we became transgender, uh, we were ostracized and, you know, basically kicked out of the, the community. Uh, when we were called drag queens, they, we were more accepted and blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's just drag queen, you know. But since we have a, an identity called transgender now, a politically correct name, if you want to call it, you know, uh, there's a lot of there's pushback in the community against uh, specifically transgender women, so specifically transgender women. We have the hardest time. Uh, you know, we live in a patriarchal society that uh, uh, you're born a man. They, 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 call, they say you're born a man. Um, I don't think anything, anyone's born a man. Um, you know, we're assigned sex at birth, you know, which is socially constructed, you know, and they use socially constructed terms to identify us and, you know, and, and uh, you know, Transgender women are at the bottom of the list of, uh, you know, in the, and really in the LGBT community. I mean, 
you can go to the center right now. Show me one picture of a transgender woman in the center. That should tell you, that should tell you what's going on, you know, that needs to change. We need to, people, they need to be more accepting of us. They need to be pictures in the community, in the center of transgender women, say, and also signs that say, we welcome transgender women into our community. You know what I'm saying? Instead of what you, when you go into the center, you see nothing of transgender women in there. Not a photo, not a picture, nothing of Marsha P. Johnson, nothing of Sylvia Rivera, nothing of me in there, nothing of other activists who put their lives on the line. Because I put my life on the line to protest for that judge. There was no security out there at Staten Island College. There was no police officers. There was nothing, no guards, nothing. We were sitting ducks. We could have been shot and nobody would have done nothing in the 90s when I protested for that lesbian judge. You know, there was like a handful of people who are afraid to be out there and they came from other schools and it was like five or five of us maybe. You know, so I put my life on the line for the LGBT community as other activists like Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson. And I think that we deserve more respect, more inclusion in the community. Um, I think that we, uh, we should have a place at the table. And when um, rules and regulations are made for us, uh, that we should, they should not be made unless we're sitting at the table, you know, and, you know, helping to make the decisions. Because if not, we're not fully protected. Because, we're, I'm, you know, I'm boots on the ground. I'm out, I'm transgender, I live in New York City, and I'm boots on the ground. And, you know, I've lived, you know, in this city, you know, I've been here off and on because I was born here since, since 1963. So, you know, which is all my life I've been here in New York City, but I came here to live to, you know, in 1986. And um, I've seen, uh, what I've seen the what hatred of LGBT people can do to children and can do to you know can do to you know to society you know and uh, I've seen the devastation I've seen the death and destruction that hatred causes and I just want the um, you know, the LGBT community to be more inclusive of transgender women and to, uh, transgender black women as well. Because, uh, you know, transgender black women are marginalized in society and pushed to the back. But I believe that, you know, and Marsha P. Johnson uh, really was the first one to throw the rock to start the riots, you know, you know, during the Stonewall riots. She got, she was tired of it. She was tired of the cops coming over there to raid the Stonewall. You know, she had just finally started, you know, you know, was able to go inside. You know, her, you know, it was a small group of them that were able to go inside because they didn't let drag queens in back then. You know, so um, I think that um, there should be a, a lot of events of getting to know each other events for the LGBT community where lesbian, with the question and answer, lesbians and gays ask transgender people questions more, you know, question and answer events you know, get to know us, because a lot of them avoid us and don't really know us. You know what I'm saying? They don't really know us. They don't. They don't know us. They don't know, you know, they don't understand, you know, you know, you know, some I've heard, oh, you just changed your body. You just changed your body because you couldn't handle being a gay man, you know, stuff like that, you know, and that's not true. I was born this way. Just like you say you was born that way. I was born this way. You know what I'm saying? I don't, you know, it's much easier to get up and put on pants and shave a beard and run out the door than put on, you know, eye makeup and stuff, you know, to feel more feminine or look more feminine and to have surgeries and have breasts and take hormones. That's hard. You know, who wants to do that? You know, unless you're trans, you know, unless you're, you know, you see yourself as a woman in your mind, Tra you know, you know, transgender is in your mind. It's in your mind, in your brain. You know, it has nothing to do with your genitals. And, you know, I use the word transition, but I really mean living your truth because um, I don't remember that word uh, when I was, when I was started living my truth. I don't remember the word transition. Nobody was using that. 
I don't know who made that up, but you're not really transitioning. You're really beginning to live your true self, you know, and you're like, you know, and you, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's revolutionary and it's liberating, you know, self-liberating to come out and be you no matter what. And it, you have to be really bold because um, I know transgender people that would never walk out into the daylight dressed. You know, I had a client when I was a case manager at Housing Works and she wouldn't shave her beard and she wouldn't put a wig on or dress up to go out. She was too afraid of, you know, what society would say, what her family would say. You know, she was, uh, she just lived in, you know, just lived in her apartment in, um, in secrecy and hiding and, and really fearful. And, you know, I, it's understandable. There's quite a few transgender people who will not come outside because of the hatred and the, um, the violence that we experience every day. You know, misgendering a transgender person is violence. And people do it like it's nothing. They know we're here. And they'll be like, you know, like, you know, even when, you go to the, when I go to the hospital, um, the nurse asks, well, um, did you get a sex change? What do you have down there? You know, like, asking me questions, like personal questions. And so, you know, I'm like, do you ask every... Uh, person that comes in here, what their genitals are, you know, and you know, and it's really traumatizing and violent because everybody else is listening, you know, it's, you know, when they do stuff like this and nothing's changed. It's still the same way. We're still treated like, still treated like, um, we're treated uh, very violently, very horrible in, in hospitals in New York City, even though we have our protections. Hospitals feel like they don't have to follow the law. You know, I don't have to follow the law. Uh, I'll call you what I see you as. Uh, a social worker told me in one of the hospitals. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know what you think you are and all this. And I don't care about your activism. And I don't care about all who you think you are, what you are when you leave here, this hospital. But, um, you know, she called me out of my gender. And I said, you know, that's violence. And uh, you're harassing me. And because she kept doing it over and over and over and over and over again. And she just totally ignored me. Totally ignored me. And there's a lot of people who are like that. You know. And I can understand why transgender people will not come outside. They will not go to the doctor. They won't go to the dentist. Um, I experienced uh, discrimination at the dentist. Everywhere I go, I experience it. Well, when it comes to suing hospitals, nobody wants to sue a hospital. They don't want to sue hospitals. They're like, oh, I handle uh, employment. I don't handle uh, hospitals. So, you know, because there's a lot going on. A lot of, you know, trans people are dying, you know, for decent health care. And, you know, they're dying for little things that everyone takes for granted. Just to be able to go to a job every day, you know, own a home, own their own car pay taxes and live, you know, you know, live a regular life, you know, without being ridiculed on a job and misgendered and harassed and, you know, oh, you want to be a woman, you know. It's not I want to be, I am. I am. You know, no matter what they say, you know, I've accepted myself. So, you know, and that's where I'm at right now. I've accepted myself. I'm a two-time cancer survivor, you know. I've had cancer, lung cancer twice. You know, I'm, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and I had to accept myself, you know. You know, you don't stay here forever on this earth, you know. But as long as I live on this earth, I'm going to, you know, live it to the fullest. I'm going to live it, you know. And I'm going to uh, make sure that trans people uh have a uh, human human rights i'm going to make sure that they have you know human rights human and civil rights in this society i'm going to make sure you know and i'm going to keep fighting you know and it's a good thing that you know that i co-founded nitag and nitag works on policy so that's what we're working on now is uh change family and stuff but 
Her family came over on that Mayflower. You know, I got just as much right here in America as any one of them. Absolutely. Even though my grandfather came from Africa. <laughs> but I still do. I feel like I do. But, you know, all, you know, all immigrants do, whether documented or undocumented. Absolutely. You know, and I want to say that on camera. <laughs> Because I and I do I do believe that you know that the you know whenever he's ready. We're good. Okay. You know I believe um, documented and undocumented immigrants have a right to the American life, American dream, and have human and civil rights, regardless of their documentation. They have a right to be here just like everybody else has a right to be here. They deserve to have jobs, be able to have health care, you know, feed their children, uh, go to their uh, religious institutions. They have the right. And uh, I believe in that. I strongly believe in that. You know, my grandfather was an immigrant. He came through, uh, he came through um, Ellis, Island. Ellis Island. My grandfather came through Ellis Island from Africa to America. And... Uh, I feel like, you know, all immigrants have the right to this American dream, no matter how they have to come in. Because, you know, most, you know, a lot come in fleeing, uh, fleeing war and uh, other things going on in their home. And they, they need to come to America to, you know, to live their life. And uh, I believe that they should be free and that no one should uh, put children in jail or uh, stop people at the border and... Uh, and, you know, uh, put them in, you know, put them in, in tents or whatever they have them in down there and uh, send them back. I don't think that's right. I think that everyone should be given a chance to live, to, you know, to, I don't, I don't know if there's an American dream or not, but they should get the chance to try it out, own a home, drive a car, you know, pay bills, you know, go on vacation, you know. And that's what I want for all trans people as well, and even undocumented. I think that they should, undocumented transgender women should be able to, uh, should be able to stay in this country, and definitely uh, get asylum, and uh, be able to get a job, be able to go to work, and not have to do sex work, and live under the margin. I think they should, you know, they should have rights here because there's they, there's no home to go back to for them for trans and gender nonconforming people. There's no home to go back to. They came here fleeing because they were being, because they were being uh, ridiculed and, and uh, threatened, their lives threatened, you know, and they've seen friends get killed or murdered. They see their friends murdered. So they're fleeing their country to come here, you know, to live a better life. And uh, I believe they deserve to be here. No. 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 Go ahead. Go ahead. We don't have to. No. Go ahead. You sure? Yeah. Where's this gonna be at? So, um, so there's gonna be two things. Yeah. The primary thing is that all of the interviews are gonna be given to the archive from yeah. the LGBT community center. Yeah. Um, and they will be made public, and so, you know, for posterity, researchers can use them, and there will be dozens and dozens of interviews with all kinds of people across New York City. Um, oh, you, so you got a lot? You have a lot? So far we've done, so I, I think, between 50 and 60. We're hoping to get to 100. Wow. Um, and then, so that's the main thing, and that your whole interview will live there. Um, and then the other thing is, that because there's so many, I don't know which ones, but some of the interviews will get cut 